so I'm Scott Podolsky, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today and to welcome you all back to the academic year. In the spring, we converted our monthly in-person social medicine series to a weekly online webinar using a social medicine lens to examine the spread, impact, and response to COVID-19, while using COVID-19 to demonstrate the importance of a social medicine lens more generally. When we last met on June 25th, there were just under 10 million documented cases of COVID worldwide, resulting in 500,000 attributed deaths. Two and a half months later, those global figures were 27 million cases and 900,000 deaths. In the US, documented cases have risen from 2.4 million since we last met to 6.4 million, and attributed deaths have risen from 117,000 to over 190,000. And of course, as we're all now well aware, the patterns of such spread and the distribution of such deaths have been far from random, but rather have been shaped by political and economic forces, and especially by patterns of pre-existing inequity. COVID thus exposes the types of biosocial forces and demands the types of biosocial responses that our departmental faculty have long engaged with and to which they've long responded. So for this fall series, we'll complement several COVID-centered webinars like this one with those related to other diseases like tuberculosis that have long warranted such a biosocial approach as well as two other series. One is a seven part social medicine quote unquote pro seminar running from now through December which while intended especially for our master's in global health delivery program students, is open to all of you as well, and focused in a curricular way on the central themes of our discipline as they relate to leading contemporary health concerns. Like this webinar series, they'll run on Wednesdays at noon so that the two series will directly complement one another. While I'll introduce and moderate the non-pro seminar sessions this fall, the pro seminar sessions will be introduced and moderated by David Jones, Salman Khashoggi, and Marty Alexander, so it will be in terrific hands. The other series I wanted to let you all know about is the longstanding and terrific medical anthropology series run by Byron and Mary Jo Good, along with Sadiq Rahimi, which runs on Fridays at 10 a.m., starting this academic year on September 18th. We'll send out schedules for all of this shortly. So it's a packed semester of programming, and we wanted to draw you in from the beginning. So of course, we're starting with Joya Mukherjee. <laughs> Having graduated from the University of Minnesota Medical School before training in internal medicine, pediatrics, and infectious diseases at MGH, and obtaining an MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health, Joy is, among many other things, the Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health, Associate Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine at HMS, and Director of our department's master's program in global health delivery. She and PIH have played a crucial role in the development of COVID-related contact tracing in Massachusetts and beyond grounding all of this within an equity framework. In fact, the subtitle of her excellent book, An Introduction to Global Health Delivery, is Practice, Equity, Human Rights. And there's no one better suited than Joya to speak to all of us about the COVID-19 pandemic and health equity. After she's done speaking, there'll be time left over for questions and answers. So I encourage all of you to submit questions through, through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, rather than the chat function if possible. And we'll do our best to get to them. So with that, I'll turn this over to Joya. Thank you, Scott. I'm just going to my screen here. And thank you all so much for tuning in. And uh, I really do hope that we have a discussion. We will have time. I'll probably keep my comments to about 50 minutes. Um, or an hour, and then we still have some time. So I'm going to talk about COVID-19, health equity, and the next pandemic. And I think when we think about the next pandemic, I, I feel like there's so much to say uh, about what a pandemic is, about how we think about pandemics. And so I wanted to just start out, sorry, uh, start out by just giving a brief introduction about Partners in Health. For those of you who don't know, we are a international medical organization that was founded in Haiti uh, almost uh, 35 years ago now. And we uh, work across the world in West Africa, East and Southern Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, and uh, Russia and Kazakhstan, as well as right here in the United States and Navajo and uh, uh, in Boston. And the lessons that we've learned from these many years of work are really what I will be talking about having to do with COVID and pandemics. 
so as social medicine uh, practitioners, it is our, and scholars, it is our job to deconstruct some of these words. And in fact, even the knowledge that, that is uh, available and, and to interrogate it. And so I've been thinking a lot about the term pandemic preparedness. And it is rooted in a set of concepts. Um, and these concepts, I think many of you know, which are prevention, detection, rapid response, health systems, regulations and norms and risks. And as we're thinking of knowledge, we're always thinking of the nature of these concepts, the nature of these conditions. What is preparedness? What is a state of preparedness? How are you prepared or unprepared? What constitutes it? What are the elements of that? And what ought and ought not to be funded in terms of pandemics? Um, and as a global health practitioner and a social medicine practitioner, it's been infinitely frustrating for me and for my team around the world, my colleagues and friends, to be in this space where we're trying to argue on what is the nature of pandemic preparedness. And so that's really what I'll be talking about today. So I'm questioning, and I will ask you all to question as well, the validity of these assumptions uh, about pandemic preparedness. They've been codified, they've been written about, they've been taught, and yet I don't think what we're seeing actually at all verifies or validates the scholarship. This is something called the Global Health Security Index, which was uh, developed between 2017 and 2020 by three important institutions, the Nuclear Threat Institute, Johns Hopkins University, and the Economist Intelligent Unit, part of the Economist magazine and um, enterprise. Uh, input uh, into this framework were factors from the World Health Organization, financial analyses, health system status, and then countries were ranked by these following factors, and this comes directly from the Global Health Security Index. Prevention. Uh, is a country involved in the prevention uh, of, of emergency, uh, the emergence of new pathogens. Detection and reporting. Um, is there an early detection system for pandemics? Uh, rapid response. Uh, it is, a, is a country able to pivot what they're doing to respond to a new or emerging threat? The health system, is it robust? Does it have uh, enough health workers? Does it have the inputs needed, the ventilators or the oxygen or the blood supply? Compliance with global norms, uh, improving national capacity and finance, etc. And then what's the overall risk environment? And based on these three years of work in producing this Global Health Security Index, which was well-funded by uh, many donors, the, the group came out in the beginning of 2020 with this index. Um, and while it is a busy slide, I will point you to the very top. The highest Global Health Security Index was the United States far and away the highest with a score of 83.5, ranking us first in the world for workforce, for epidemiologic preparedness, response planning. And this was done during the current administration. So this is not a historic document. Um, and then at the bottom, you have countries like Yemen, which is involved in an ongoing war. Here's our beloved Haiti at just 31.5. Um, but I'm going to draw your attention to a couple more places and then look at them for comparison. Sorry, there we go. Belgium at 60.1. The United States, as I mentioned, at 83.5. And the country of Rwanda at about 35. So these are three countries that we will be looking at, comparing, and talking about. Now, this is the uh, assumption that in terms of global health security, these countries would be more or less prepared, Rwanda being far less than Belgium, Belgium being slightly less than the United States. 
So here I'm taking three populations of similar size. The state of Georgia in the United States, home of the once venerated CDC, with a population of 10.6 million people. Uh, the nation of Belgium, the former con colonizer of Rwanda, Burundi, and Congo, with a population of 11.5 million. And the country of Rwanda with a population of 12.3 million. In the first 30 days from community transmission of COVID, and this is data that I extrapolated from the uh, coronavirus mapping project at Johns Hopkins University, there were 4,400 cases in Georgia, 7,400 cases in the nation of Belgium, and 134 cases in Rwanda. When we look at just one small piece of the health system, there are many other indicators. Doctors per capita in Georgia, 2.6 per 100,000 population in Belgium, 3, and in Rwanda, just 0.1. Um, and then here is the cumulative COVID cases. This is from the European CDC website. You see Rwanda has not only flattened the curve, they have kept the curve flat. Belgium has gone well over 80,000, and this is by September 8th, so this is real-time data. And as of today, the state of Georgia has 283,000 cases of COVID. You can't even show it on this graph. So what happened? And this blurry picture is not a house. This is not a house. And this is, not a, uh, this is not a health system. And I think when we look at these um, indicators of health system, the assumption is that the United States has a health system. And in fact, we do not. We have the building blocks of a health system. We have the wood, we have the nails, we have the personnel. But we have not put together these building blocks in a way that will actually provide the shelter, the care that is needed. We have a variety of flows of funding. We have very high out-of-pocket expenditure. We have a fragmentation between state, federal, and private. And then we have providers of care who are not necessarily accountable to a system. This is all our care system. Our public health system has been progressively defunded over the last 40 years since Ronald Reagan and the neoliberal project. And so what we find is while the elements may be there, the system is not. So in my previous life, I was an engineer. And I think a lot about engineering diagrams. Engineering diagrams show forces as arrows. And the arrow generally has a, a, a length that tells you the magnitude and a direction of the force. So this is a very simple balancing equation. But when we think of social medicine, we often talk about social determinants. But as my students know, I prefer to talk about fo social forces because I do believe they have a magnitude and a direction. And so if we consider COVID and the balancing act that every country is in right now, balancing between control of this virus and the chaos that will ensue, we have definitely things that are pushing us toward chaos. The biology of the virus is one. Of course, it is a novel virus. But if it was just a matter of biology, that then countries would be equally affected by COVID. And we know that they're not. We know that they're not just from that uh, small example of Belgium, Georgia, and Rwanda. But then we have the heavier weight of the biologic, or uh, excuse me, of the social and the political forces. The social forces like racism, the social forces like extreme poverty and policies that keep people poor, and the political forces that uh, show whether or not leadership uh, is going to be effective. So how do we actually mitigate this force that's pushing us toward chaos? And I would postulate that our experience at Partners in Health um, and with countries around the world and here in the state of Massachusetts is that the way we push back on those nefarious forces of social and political um, inequity and social and political harm 
is by care, designing systems for equity, engendering trust, and leadership. And those are things that are not captured in the dynamic forces uh, needed to mitigate harm in this pandemic. So you see prevention, detection, rapid response, health system, compliance with global norms. This is an extremely technocratic kind of list and it does not take into account these vast social forces, nor how to mitigate them. So I'm going to be sort of focusing my remarks on what we have learned at Partners in Health by combating other pandemics, um, as well as this pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, in four major areas. One is care. Uh, we believe that there is a moral basis for care, that it's not enough to just say this group, whether it's you know people living in nursing homes or prisoners or migrant workers, uh, is more expendable. There is a moral basis for care. That compassion is needed, that we have to really understand, listen to the affected. Solidarity, which is really that we are not only in this together, as people say, it's become almost a trope, but that we feel each other's pain, that we can stand together and work through problems to get to the other side and the mutuality of this work. The second is really equity. And how do we look for and measure equity in our health systems, in our responses? And that is really the attention to the most vulnerable, we often talk about it as social support or psychosocial support, and I'll go into that. The third is trust. How do we engender trust? And in a pragmatic way, that is clearly through accessibility and quality of services and the treatment of people when they come forward to care. And then lastly, and really can't be understated, is the need of leadership, leadership that takes into account care, equity, and trust, but that is also rooted in logic, reason, and accountability. And I think we've seen great examples of that, and then we've also seen great uh, and terrible examples of the lack of reason. So um, we... When we started to put together our response, PIH's response to COVID back in February, uh, we said that we were going to uh, track along these four areas. One, our leadership would be supporting leaders through global advocacy, making sure that they had money. Uh, many of my colleagues are working with, uh, you know, advocating for the U.S. government to give money to COVID, uh, keep uh, to keep global health funding going despite this terrible economic depression that we're in, but also the, the, the specific support of government leadership in the places we work, whether it's in the state of Massachusetts or in the government of Liberia. And so we are accompanying gover governments to do the things they need to do for their people. The second is care. And here, I mean, actually having care in this compassionate and solidarity uh, way, I mean, engaging community members in outreach and support. That part of saying we're in this together is being in this together, is being in places with people, is visiting people in their homes, is making sure that um, we are feeling that with people. And then trust in the health system is based and rooted in providing high quality care uh, for patients with COVID. And then equity for us is always providing that support for the most vulnerable. So I'm just gonna talk about uh, the founding of Partners in Health, which was really based on this moral basis for care, compassion, solidarity, and mutuality. And community health workers have been the backbone of our work. And I saw that Ophelia Dahl had joined since Ophelia was, you know, uh, living in Haiti. It was about working together with community and saying, what are your needs? What do you need? Listening, walking together with community members. And the, our community members were really harnessed early on in Haiti for 
tuberculosis treatment. And we saw that they were a huge advantage in providing longitudinal treatment um, that could bring care actually to the patients, that could network with the clinic, that could provide that support. And the solidarity is that many of these community members were current and even former patients. And they also are huge and important network for the psychosocial support, for understanding, do, do people need food? Do they need a roof over their head? So that moral basis of care really was one of the first and most important things of our early work in Haiti to address the pandemic of tuberculosis that was really very, very prevalent at the time in the community of Conj. And how did that, how did that care and that equity help us in the next pandemic? Well, of course, as we started to see that HIV was coming into these communities, community health workers and community-based organizations played a critical role in HIV scale-up. We applied many of these lessons from the TB pandemic and in fact used the, the infrastructure, the community-based infrastructure to layer on this next challenge. But what we found with HIV is that community health workers and um, even connected with the clinic was not enough because people needed to have access to care. I'm gonna go back to that in a second. So, um, Part of our work in HIV was to engender trust by improving the provision of basic care. So in Haiti, we called HIV our battle horse, saying that it was never about dealing with this pandemic of HIV alone. It was about building systems of care so that people who had any problem, whether it was an epidemic disease like TB or HIV, or just a regular health condition like pregnancy could be seen. And we did really four things in the clinics, very basic clinics as you see here on the left, the Clinic Saint-Michel, Boucancaré, um, and put in um, staff. We paid the public sector staff. We put in essential drugs, not just HIV drugs. We reduced the user fees so that people could you know, come in without that access and hired and trained an army of community health workers. So in scaling up over the first four clinics, we saw a tremendous utilization of basic medical services based on these investments. And so as people, you know, in this left-hand side, the clinic didn't have staff, didn't have supplies, and people said, oh, no one trusts the system. People don't come forward because they don't trust. But who would go to a clinic like that? I wouldn't trust my health or the health of my child to that clinic. So it's only when you have systems in place that trust can be there. I want to go back for a second to the notion of care and security versus solidarity. Because as we think of global health security, I've never particularly liked the term security. This is a picture from Parc Jean-Marie Vincent, which was a huge camp of displaced people in the Haitian earthquake. And the people with orange shirts are my colleagues from Zami La Santé. Um, but, uh, but in the crowd are also many people who we had hired who were helping us to provide care. And this is just a general outpatient clinic. So one day, the U.S. military approached my colleague Pierre Paul, who was in charge of running this clinic. And this clinic was in what was called the red zone, a very dangerous, supposedly dangerous part of Haiti where many NGOs would not go. And the government said, please help us there because this, there are 85,000 people. They are displaced and they need basic health care. So the U.S. military came to us and they said, we'd like to distribute food. What days do you have clinic? And we said, well, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We initially only had clinic three days a week and then went to five days a week. So, you know, if you want, you can come Tuesday and Thursday. It'll be less chaotic. And the U.S. military, with all their guns and all their weapons, said, oh, no, no, no. We want to go when you're there. And they weren't talking about just Pierre Paul, although for those of you who know him, he's quite a force of nature. 
but they were talking about the solidarity that people felt for Zami La Sante and how that would provide protection for the US military. So the notion of solidarity gives us security. And I believe my colleague, Frené Leand, is also on the phone, who's a graduate of the master's program, and I am a graduate of the School of Zami La Sante. And this we have learned over and over again, that the thing that gives us security, regardless of the danger or red zone or whatever, is our connection with other people, our connection with the community, and doing these works of solidarity. So part of the provision of care alone gives us security. Um, and then, you know, equity. We, we have always worked on reaching the most vulnerable, and that might be providing transportation. That might be meeting patients where they are. This is a picture from some of our workers in Peru in PPE going to homes to collect samples for COVID. So they're trying to provide for the most vulnerable who can't get to a testing site. We have distribution of food service going on. We have mental health services um, in every country we work that are going on currently during COVID and even providing safe shelter for people. And so this equity proposition is the way to, again, address pandemics in, so that the most vulnerable will be taken into account. So as I said, the work in Haiti, when we started to expand it with HIV, it was really creating systems of care that people could trust. And they were not sophisticated necessarily, not as sophisticated as they need to be, because we were just starting. But over time, we saw that this system, which is community-based, access to health centers, but still with hospital care was a critical element to engender trust. That just community health workers alone were insufficient because people were often too sick to be dealt with by only a community health worker. Similarly, health centers are great, but if a woman needs a cesarean, she may have to go to a hospital. Now these may seem unrelated to pandemics, but this is the very system that provides the security um, for a pandemic. So this system of taking HIV money and using it to expand services was done best in Rwanda. And this is a, a slide from my colleague, Dr. Uh, Sabat, who now runs the COVID response in Rwanda. And this shows you the, the sparse nature of any kind of services for HIV in Rwanda in 2004 and then in 2013. And in improving the access to service, people then begin to trust the system. So it used to be that when we started the work in Rinkwavu, Rwanda, everyone from around the, the uh, country came there and they said, well, it's because you give food, it's because of this, it's because, because people didn't have trust that the system was there for them. And now people can go within an hour of their home to get HIV services. So that kind of uh, decentralization, delivering of quality care provides trust in the system. And Rwanda was one of the first countries to uh, achieve 90% of people on antiretroviral therapy. And how did that trust help us with the next pandemic. So as I said, the care aspect and the community health workers um, and the notion of care really helped us from tuberculosis to HIV. But the notion of trust really helped us in the next pandemic, which in Haiti was cholera, or epidemic anyway. Um, why? Because we had built hospitals, we had trained doctors, nurses, we had drug supply. And so the first case, not surprisingly, the first case of cholera in the country was diagnosed by Zami La Sante physicians and nurses in a Partners in Health supported Ministry of Health hospital in St. Mark Haiti. And we never stocked out of IV fluids. So the death rate, imagine, would have been so much higher if those investments weren't made in the health system. Now, we were not actually preparing for the next pandemic, if you were. We were preparing a health system that would work for people. And so the community health worker 
network was mobilized immediately to outreach to people, engender that kind of care and equity approach, the trust in the health system allowed people to come forward, and we were able to treat thousands of cases of cholera. And what about trust in the next pandemic having to do with Ebola? Well, when Partners in Health was invited to West Africa, we said it's not just about Ebola. If we just fight Ebola, we will not be able to engender trust in the community. And on the left, you see the pictures of people being hauled off to units. Uh, and on the right, uh, uh, a worker, and this is not a PIH picture, but this is a worker from an Ebola treatment unit actually caring for a sick child. What we saw, and what my colleague Byler Berry did in his master's program, and I have a picture of him later on, was to show that as services got better, as the treatment improved, people came forward. And we then invested in developing systems, because West Africa has some of the worst health systems in the world, so that we could do facility-based delivery, so that we could have a clean place for people to come and do triage and wash their hands. And the investments made during Ebola, which included, by the way, oxygen, blood transfusion, improved facilities, have helped us against subsequent epidemics like measles, like loss of fever, and even COVID, because these things have relied on the infrastructure that we built to treat the sick. Um, I'm going to show, uh, you know, just some examples from the L'Hôpital Mibale, which was the investment we made in very high quality care, tertiary care in Haiti after the Haitian earthquake. It's not only pandemics that force us to prepare, but natural disasters. We were caught flat-footed in the country of Haiti with only two or three orthopedic surgeons for the entire nation of 11 million people. So obviously the investments we're making are not just for the next time somebody has a broken leg, but in fact, oxygen, ventilators, uh, adequate protection of health workers and connection to the communities. So now the L'Hôpital Mibale is the COVID center for the uh, nation of Haiti. And we are also providing still community work, mental health support, food and housing. And so to continue to layer on services of support. Laboratory testing uh, was iteratively built on funding from cholera, funding from Zika, um, we have wall oxygen, we have ICU beds, we have resident trained physicians and advanced nursing. Does that help us in preparing for a pandemic? Yes. Is it why we did it? No, we did it for equity. So, you know, I want to talk about leadership um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the United States work. Uh, this is probably one of the best international leaders in this period, uh, Jacinda Arden. Uh, Ardern, uh, who said the worst case scenario is simply intolerable. She's talking about herd immunity here. The government will do all it can to protect you. None of us can do this alone. So that kind of leadership that her administration has shown has been profound. And uh, yes, many would say, oh, New Zealand's an island and this and that, but it, it, is, uh, it, it is nonetheless true that the commitment from the top um, is a critical part of responding to pandemics. And we've seen this throughout the world from, you know, great leaders, um, you know, like, like President Kagame in Rwanda to Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in, in Liberia um, and many in between who really took this on. Um, and on the other hand, that and enough said. So what does it take to lead during a pandemic? Well, I would say clear communication and transparency. This is again, uh, my friend, Dr. Sebe, who is the director general of the Rwanda Biomedical Center, which is the, the nerve center that is handling this epidemic. Um, this has close collaboration with, um, with the president's office. There are 200 people in the command center from government, from NGOs, working 24 seven. It's managed in a large, well-ventilated tent. And there is an electronic database that's updated hourly. 
ident identified cases among travelers initially. Um, and I'm gonna talk again about the first 100 days. So what was their model? Top level priority, the president's office, the prime minister, out being part of the message, consistent messaging daily. National coordination, that's multi-sectoral. That's not only health, but it was also transportation, also the education sector. That districts and provinces are coordinated and not each you know, zone on their own. And that contact tracing uh, is done by community and government supports quarantine. So this is just the first month of response. There were 44 imported cases. The first case was reported 3-14-2020. 10 uh, were confirmed positive of the close contacts, the 1,281 close contacts, and 86% of them were immediately isolated at government-supported facilities with food, private bathroom, et cetera. So those 14% that were not isolated were eventually tracked. So how do we learn from these lessons and accompany governments? Well, as I said, we support public health leadership. This is a, a, a photo from our team in Liberia. The government asked for some screening booths and we said yes. And our colleague, Dr. Max Oluma, the executive director of PIH in Liberia, he even has a shirt that says, say yes. Uh, we, we really try to support what the public sector wants to do so that they can have leadership. Uh, procurement of the supplies. Uh, we're saying this is not just for partners in health, but in fact for the government. Support for the plans, the personnel, and upgrading facilities. So now I'm going to move for the last little bit here, uh, 15, uh, 20 minutes, to the idea of local, global to local and national. In February and March, as I said, we were preparing our work uh, for the partners in health sites around the world. Um, and Jim Kim, our, uh, our co-founder and good friend, uh, said, why aren't we doing this in the United States? And we were, of course, supporting Navajo. But other than the work that we had ongoing in Navajo, we were not uh, doing that. And so he talked to Governor Baker. Um, and on April 3rd, Governor Baker announced that Partners in Health would be supporting uh, something called the Contact Tracing Collaborative. And so I'll talk about that briefly. <clears throat> the idea was to provide this kind of care, to fundamentally involve community members in caring for one another, to support equity so that the most vulnerable would get what they needed, right? Um, and to engender trust in the system through a variety of, of means, and then, um, and then really to support the leadership of Governor Baker and the Department of Public Health. So we knew that people were getting tested, but there was very little contact tracing because the Department of Public Health was overwhelmed with the number of cases. It was very difficult for people to socially distance or isolate. These principles are extremely economically regressive. And so our work was in tracing and support. This is what the contact tracing collaborative looked like, many of you, and still looks like. Uh, we have fewer people now because the cases have gone down. But people were trained to be case investigators. They would do this virtually. They would enumerate the contacts and then call the people who were contacts and, and try to get them tested, but also talk to them about whether or not these contacts or these cases, people who had exposure, had the material means to isolate. Did they have food? Did they have adequate shelter? Did they have um, enough space? And that Last piece, the care resource coordinator, that is the meat of what the partners in health experience has been in pandemics. If you don't provide community engagement, the material support to engender trust in the system, that you can't really have pandemic response that's successful. So we're very proud of our care resource coordinators. Many of them were social workers, nurses, people who had already been in the community. We in fact hired 25% of our contact tracers were people that were um, working at federally qualified and community health centers. So they already knew the community. And 
Our resource care coordinators uh, speak 23 languages. They're experienced professionals. They're related to a geography so they can know what supports are there and they work within the local community to address vulnerability. This is just some of the support that people needed. Food was the large uh, number, more than 7,000 <clears throat> requests for social services, social assistance in the first three months. Food, other um, which are rent, eviction, specific household items. So, you know, if this is happening in Massachusetts, the richest state in the richest country in the world, imagine what this would be like in Haiti or Liberia. So based on this work in Massachusetts, and as many of you know, by, by April, May, it seemed quite obvious that the US was going to be or already was the epicenter of the pandemic. And we started to be asked by other uh, states, cities, community groups, can you help us do contact tracing in the United States? Uh, we were having this kind of philosophical argument with academics all over the country. It's too late to contact trace. It's not possible. Um, it's not something the United States can do. <clears throat> But um, in fact, we had so many requests that we could not manage the volume of requests without hiring um, additional staff. So we received a grant from the Audacious Foundation, um, which is a, a group of funders that are interested in sort of big ideas. And we put together what we call the US Public Health Accompaniment Unit. And what we do is embed partners and health people into teams either at the Department of Public Health, sometimes in a community organization, sometimes the City Department of Public Health, sometimes the State Department of Public Health, and work together with them to do plans, to put together workforce plannings, to figure out how to track the patients, what technology to use, to figure out how to expand testing. And then we have a learning collaborative uh, where we bring people together to share lessons learned, and then work to advocate for change at the federal and state level. And this is really based on these four principles of care, equity, trust, and leadership. And so now the public health accompaniment unit is helping in about two dozen different places, places like the state of Illinois, the state of North Carolina, and the city of Newark as well as the city of Montgomery. We're also working with community organizations like the Coalition of Immokalee Workers that I'm gonna mention in a second. So I'm gonna give you the example of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers uh, because when we think about social forces, this is who we are as the US. Um, our racism, our indignities of people of color, whether they're Black, Indigenous, or Latinx, are profound and are driving this epidemic. And so when we think about how to balance control of an epidemic over chaos, we have to double down on care and concern for these very communities. So we were approached by an organization called the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. It's an organization of uh, farm workers that are based in Immokalee, Florida. Uh, they are mostly from Latin America and the Caribbean, but particularly Mexico, Guatemala, and Haiti, three countries that we've been long connected with. Uh, they speak uh, a, a mixture of English, Spanish, Creole, and mom. Uh, and they had been organizing for many years, almost three decades, to get fair wages and to connect their labor for a fair wage to our consumption of products. So this is a, a picture of a picket line that was done by the Coalition of Immokalee Workers um, for, uh, uh, at Wendy's. And they were successful in winning uh, that fight for fair wages uh, for that uh, fast food chain for the, the commodities that they were picking. Uh, the, the coalition is, is, uh, knows the community of Immokalee very well, but unfortunately what we see is the forces of racism are so powerful uh, 
in the United States and in Florida, we definitely see them particularly strongly, that the, the state government had no interest in testing or caring for the people of Immokalee. So one of the jobs that Partners in Health had when we were in, uh, approached by the Coalition of Immokalee Workers was to build bridges with the Department of Public Health. And so here is the Coalition of Immokalee Workers plus as well as our team members and Dr. Ferne Leon is going to Immokalee shortly to uh, take over uh, from Matt Hing, who's in the middle there and uh, heading back to medical school, um, but to really build bridges, to train health workers. Um, and so that has been our work. So when we think again about this idea of the forces of chaos in the first thousand patients that were tested in Immokalee, 42% were positive. That is not because of a biologic, uh, you know, susceptibility to COVID. It's because of the political economy of being a farm worker and undocumented in America. These folks live in trailers of many, many people. They don't have their own transport. They're taken to the fields by bus, crowded buses. They have no access to medical care. The state feels no responsibility in the public health realm. Um, so, and we know politically that particular governor, Governor DeSantis, has been um, actually actively hiding cases of, of COVID. And so we have to call out these forces that are tipping this epidemic toward chaos and harm and double down on the ideas that will mitigate these social forces. So our, our engagement in Immokalee is fourfold. We are engaging community health workers through the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. We've put together trainings in Spanish and Haitian Creole and now have several uh, promotores de salud that are going um, and informing people, getting them to testing. We are working with uh, the Catholic Church there, Mission Penial, for food, uh, social support. Uh, this is a group that has long supported and been in solidarity with the farm workers. We are working to build bridges with the Department of Public Health. And we're trying, even behind the scenes, to coordinate with allies at the Department of Public Health. So this is similar to the work that we're doing in, in, in Newark, New Jersey. This is similar to what we're doing in, in Navajo. Um, and there are places you know, all over uh, that need this kind of support. So I just wanna conclude by saying, we really need to re rethink the concept of pandemic preparedness and move it away from a biomedical and technocratic uh, type of work to a much more socially uh, uh, aware and based in solidarity and trust. Uh, secondly, that inputs into a health system uh, without a basis in care and without leadership result in chaos. And that is what we're seeing in the United States, despite our eight to $10,000 per person per year that we put into health care, we do not have a system. We have no leadership and we are not basing it on this idea of care and connection with the community. And that lastly, to focus on health and human rights um, and equity, we have to address vulnerability. And this is the long-term work that we need to prepare for the next pandemic is equity now. So um, I'll stop there and I think we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Joya, so, so, so much. It, it's interesting. I mean, you start off by showing that global preparedness document and saying this is not historic, meaning it's not an old document. But certainly as a, any future historians will look at that and say that really was indicative of that time and it, it is a marker. And we see the, what was built into that, the metrics built into that kind of a graph versus the kinds of forces and, and eth underlying ethos that that's necessary in, in, in response moving forward is profoundly different. So really grateful for that juxtaposition and for that presentation. Um, just for everyone online, feel free to bring in your questions through um, the Q&A function, and I'm happy to pass them along to Dr. Mukherjee. Um, I'm happy to go first. Um, you know, we, we, we've been formulating this, this social medicine pro-seminar series as a way of examining, in part, what social medicine even means. 
you yourself have your, your master's in public health and much yeah. of those metrics that were originally shown were, 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 were sort of types of public health preparedness that we think about. So for, for, for those of us trying to think about what's a public health approach to this versus a social medicine approach and, and, and how this would apply to COVID, can, can, you, can you lay that out for us? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I am a, a fairly harsh, and I don't mean to be because I have many wonderful friends and colleagues from the School of Public Health, but, you know, uh, there are two things that I think had been sorely lacking for many years, and I think public health is changing. Um, but one is that, you know, public health was historically really focused on prevention alone. And, you know, prevention is is not care, right? If you're, if you're preventing future disease, which is important, you're not necessarily caring for the people in front of you. And, you know, many of us who worked in global health 25, 30 years ago know that you would be giving vaccinations to children. And if somebody had a broken leg, you would just say, well, there's nothing we can do about that. So I think the, the focus on prevention, which was driven by economics, the notion of selective primary health care that came out after Alma-Ata as, as an antidote to a more uh, wholesome approach, a holistic approach to health. Um, so one of the critiques is this focus on prevention without care. And we've been fighting this battle for many years that you need both prevention and care. Um, that people will come forward for prevention if they feel that there's care. But that's also how you engender trust. So one big critique is that. And I think social medicine teaches us that because when you are a practitioner of social medicine, you want to understand what is it that motivates somebody? You know, what are they thinking of? What is their life like? You want to understand the lived experience. You want to do even a short time, a kind of ethnography. What, is, what do you do for a living? What, what, is your, what do you feed your family? Go visit the home, as Mary Jo Good says, hang out. And once you do that, you see that the things that are important are not necessarily the shot you're giving that day. And so I think the practice of social medicine is a much more deep analysis of the lived experience of people and what, where they are in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and really trying to deeply understand that. The second thing I would say that makes social medicine different is, and this is, this is what I'm saying about forces. When we talk about the social determinants, it is really kind of a sterile and I think somewhat aggregated approach. So we can, you, you know, we can look at the racially disaggregated data or gender disaggregated data, but if we really don't understand the way those forces are moving on that, on that balance, right, and what we can do to mitigate them, you know, that is the practice of social medicine. So not just recounting them, but doing something about it. And that's where I think we need to be looking at scholars who talk about race, who talk about gender, and how we take those uh, pernicious forces and really address them within the health sector, within the, the, the programs that we, we have to, to alleviate harm and make people well. Got thank you, Joya. Questions. No, no, yes. thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm scanning the, the questions as well. So, so one question asked, oh, why Asian and African countries seem less affected from COVID-19 than, than the United States? And we may contest some of that, but, but your, your thoughts on that and how it relates to your talk today? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, Asian and African countries are doing a better job, by and large. By and large, they're doing a better job. So first of all, even though poor uh, or impoverished, I prefer the term impoverished to poor, uh, the, that you know, countries have had their resources you know, exploited, there it has been over the last 15 years, 15 to 20 years, particularly based on the AIDS movement, investments in health that people trust. And they are doing the thing of pushing back on this dread pandemic of HIV right, on, on malaria, to lesser extent in tuberculosis, and people have seen the impact of those. And so there is a trust in the system. There is a lot of leadership 
from countries like Korea, like uh, Singapore, like China, um, and certainly Rwanda, uh, Malawi, where we actually see that the government say, this is our national plan, this is what we're gonna do. And because that those systems have been set up and people have seen a salutary effect of a health system on their lives, they trust that system. So I, you know, I think that what we see is truly a different paradigm for pandemic pre preparedness than just the, you know, the inputs, just the wood and the nails of the building, but no building. And I feel that many of the countries around the world have built something. And even though it's not great, even though it, it needs a lot of support, but it's, it's, it's a structure and it has a plan. And, you know, that's what you need, but that has to be built on these, you know, fundamental social medicine principles of equity and justice and fairness that engender trust. One of the attractions of, of the, the, the types of charts that you did show early on are, are, are these metrics that seem to, to show areas for improvement, et cetera. And when you have, it's all based on, on care and equity and trust and leadership, how do you either convert that to either a metric or how do you communicate that to current leadership that, that may not be invested in that? And, and how do you convince them to change? Um, yeah, that's, that's a really, I mean, we all lose a lot of sleep over that. Um, so I'll just put in my small plug, please vote uh, <laughs> if you're American. Um, I think, you know, in many countries, people do vote with their feet. And health is largely quite political. Um, and we've seen governments rise and fall on the strength of health systems in, in some countries because people do see that as a fundamental need. So I think there is that aspect of health that is political and that often leaders uh, will see that. And, and I, don't, I don't look at leadership, even in the United States, as a monolith. Um, we've seen mayors, like the mayor of Mirbale, who shut down a hospital, which was terrible, and brought everybody to PIH to kind of pressure us to build a hospital in his town. That's leadership, right? That's leadership around health. So I think if you do a good job, um, then it speaks for itself, and the right leaders will come forward. I mean, I, I think our collaboration in Newark, for example, with the mayor of Newark, Ross Baraka, is a person who really cares deeply about the people of his city, who really understands that racism is at the root of the COVID pandemic being disproportionately in Newark, and so reached out you know, to us and the Newark Alliance, which is a kind of chamber of commerce group, um, so I think that what we've seen coming forward in the Coalition of Immokalee Workers is the work does speak for itself to the people who want to listen. I think to the people who don't want to listen, um, I'm not sure, like, I don't know if it's worth working with the people who don't want to listen. I, you know, I, I guess I, I feel tired of trying to convince people of the humanity of others. And I prefer to build a coalition of people who believe in the humanity of others and, and, and allow that work to replicate. Now, that doesn't mean it's the right thing. I think we have to all put our energies where our energies are best positioned. But, you know, convincing the Trump administration of the humanity of migrants, I mean, I wouldn't waste a minute doing that. Personally, Makes sense. Uh, related to this, somebody asked the question uh, concerning the parameters or measurements that can be used to assess a health system's trust and solidarity. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the one of the things that I think we can use, you know, we 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 certainly do a lot of qualitative work, uh, and again, this is a very important social medicine thing. You cannot just use data right, and apps. And so, you know, many of us uh, who are in the department, who are, you know, at PIH and other things, you know, using, you know, qualitative analysis, understanding people's lives, understanding patient satisfaction, um, those are really important. But the other, the other thing are, is also utilization data. Um, people do vote with their feet. If they trust the health system, they come forward. And 
I, I'm sure people remember in, during the Ebola crisis in West Africa, there were health workers that were killed. And there's always this idea that, well, people X, you know, the people from Guinea don't believe in the health system or people, you know. But what we see is the same thing here, right? That if there's nothing to trust, people are going to be angry. You know, it's, an un, it's, it's a new and invisible thing. Uh, and there isn't the systemic trust. So I think, you know, people doing well, people using a facility, that, that these are measures of trust. And then of course, asking people what they think, right? Um, so, you know, one of the things I worry about a lot is that, you know, we have in this country really lost so much faith in science as a people, so much ability to uh, believe in logic and reason that even if we have a vaccine tomorrow, as you and I were talking about, Scott, it's not at all clear to me that Americans would want to do it. They won't believe it. Now, I wouldn't believe it if it's a Trump vaccine tomorrow, but that's part of the problem, right? It's become so politicized and illogical that, and, and I don't think we have that level of mistrust. Um, and I, you know, I, I, reflecting back on Ebola in, in Liberia, uh, there was a lot of discussion, Ebola is not real. And so there was, a, you know, there were posters made saying Ebola is real. But I'll tell you that the health system in Liberia was totally not prepared for Ebola. If I was a mother with a small child, I would never have gone to the health system, whether I thought I had Ebola or not. I would have stayed at home, put garbage bags on my hands and taken care of my kid at home because, so it wasn't that people necessarily didn't think it was real or not real. You know, it's just that there is no system to trust. But today, you know, where we work in Liberia, it's busy every day. People are coming for it every day. Are they willing to get screened for COVID, stand over here, wear a mask? Yes, because they know when they're sick with other things, we'll be there, right? And so I, I just think the the whole idea of people believing or not believing and trust is really about whether you are taking care of them or not. And, um, you know, I, I think there is a big difference between law and order, you know, because a lot of the idea of epidemic control historically in colonial medicine has been about law and order and protection of white people and settlers and the difference between that and compassion and solidarity. And if your response is really around keeping order and, you know, keeping the lid on dissent and quarantining, you know, the West Point slum of, of Monrovia, uh, that's not going to engender trust, right? And so I, I just feel like the, the way historically we've responded to pandemics has not engendered trust in people. Fair enough. All right, we have time for one more question, and this is from our, our colleague, Louise Ivers. Um, and in way to both structures and cultures, do you feel that most Americans have been receptive slash trusting to contact tracing, and is it more or less than what you have encountered in other countries you have done disease prevention measures in? Yeah, um, thanks, Louise. I mean, I, I think, you know, initially, people were skeptical of contact tracing because again, I don't think the health system works so well for people in the United States. Um, so people were skeptical, but because we, you know, were very much, uh, you know, community people, people who are from the community, we had people speaking many languages. We had many town halls across the state in, in Brockton and in Chelsea and Greenfield. And um, over time, we could iterate on the concerns people had. So first, for example, because it's all virtual, you know, the phone calls didn't come through with an obvious number. And we realized that in that there was inequity because people have to pay for caller ID. And so the poorest people didn't have caller ID. And so what ought to have said Massachusetts COVID did not. Right. And it would be like scam likely or something. So we we worked with the telecom com companies to waive that fee for this number. That was one thing. 
Then the second thing was around language, adding in language groups. You know, we ended up having 23 different languages. So, you know, you could say, well, you know, if we do Creole and Spanish and Portuguese, that's enough, but, it, but clearly it's not enough, right? Um, the third thing was, as people saw that there was care involved, you know, and I remember uh, being in the press conference with Governor Baker and saying, you know, this contact tracing is about care. And in the like chat in the Facebook Live thing, people are like, that's bullshit, you know, but it's not bullshit. And maybe it was bullshit for the guy who said it. But over time, people, you know, the stories we have, people understanding that, you know, they were out of infant formula, we would find a way to get it. Um, that spreads word of mouth. So there was no difference um, in my mind uh, in how people trusted or not the system uh, than, in, than in any other country um, I've worked in. No, thank you. And again, for reverse engineering, whatever we want to call it, for bringing the lessons that you and PIH have done throughout the world, throughout their own state, it's been remarkable. Your talk was terrific. It got the, the whole, both our seminar series off to a great start. It's a fantastic framing for the pro seminar series. So thank you very much, Joya. Uh, for everyone online, I want to let oh, you know that- Oh, it wasn't our... Louise, it was Carrie, her assistant. Hi, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Louise was hacked by her, her, her assistant, but it's all good. It's still a valuable question. So thank you, Carrie. Um, so I want to let you know that our next talk will be in two weeks on, the, um, on September 23rd, our dear colleague and historian, Alan Brandt, will lead off the pro seminar series. Um, he's speaking on, quote, no magic bullet, reconsidering COVID-19 and a new age of pandemics, uh, lending his own unique perspective to how we might reconsider the principles and perspectives of social medicine in the current context of, of the COVID pandemic. And Paul Farmer will, sound, will serve as a discussant. So this should be terrific. Um, definitely mark your calendars. Uh, thank you again to the Joya for just a, a really wonderful talk. So thank you. Okay. Take Thanks, care, everyone. everyone. Bye. Thank <clears throat> you.